the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11pm, seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hello and welcome to Headliners. I'm Dominic Frisby and with me tonight, looking at tomorrow's papers, we have Scott Capuro and Stephen Grant. But before we hear from them, we hear from our newsreader, who tonight is Tamsin Roberts. Dominic, thank you. Good evening from the GB newsroom. Britain is sending 6,000 more missiles to Ukraine. Boris Johnson says the UK is providing anti-tank and high-explosive weaponry. The Prime Minister is also committing £25 million to help pay the salaries of Ukrainian soldiers and pilots. He's travelling to Brussels tomorrow for talks with fellow NATO and G7 leaders. President Zelensky will make a statement to the NATO summit. Just a warning, there are flashing images in the pictures coming up. President Biden has landed in Brussels ahead of those emergency talks. He'll also meet with G7 leaders and address the European Union. The president is expected to announce a package of Russia-related sanctions on political figures and oligarchs. It comes as Russia's foreign ministry announced it would throw out an unspecified number of American diplomats. Well, Ukraine has accused Russia of seizing 15 rescue workers and drivers from a humanitarian convoy trying to bring supplies into the besieged port city of Mariupol. New footage shows the destruction in the city following weeks of heavy shelling. President Volodymyr Zelensky says 100,000 civilians remain trapped there without food, water or medicine. The Chancellor has been accused of being out of touch with the reality facing millions of families after his spring statement did not include an increase in benefits. The comments from the Institute for Fiscal Studies come as inflation reaches a 30-year high. Rishi Sunak has introduced a range of measures including cutting fuel duty by five pence a litre until March next year. VAT is also being scrapped on energy-saving measures such as solar panels, heat pumps and insulation. And the threshold for paying national insurance will increase by £3,000 from July, meaning employees will save around £330 a year. Last year I told the House I would cut taxes for hard-working families, but I would do so in a responsible and sustainable way. And today, I am delivering on that promise. Jamaica's Prime Minister has told Prince William he intends to fulfil his country's ambition to become independent. The Duke and Duchess of Cambridge had an official meeting with Andrew Holness as part of their tour of the Caribbean, marking the Queen's Platinum Jubilee. He says their presence provided an excellent opportunity to address unresolved issues. UEFA has received declarations of interest to host Euro 2028 from three potential bidders following today's deadline. Earlier, Russia said it was considering rivalling the UK and Ireland for the right to host the tournament. That's despite an international ban over its invasion of Ukraine. Now, Turkey has also applied to host the event. UEFA says a decision will be announced in September. TV, online and DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. Now it's back to Dominic and Headliners.
Thank you, Tamsin. Hello and welcome to Headliners, the show that saves you the bother of having to read the papers by getting comedians to read them for you. With me tonight, we have that bloke from Brighton, Stephen Grant. Hello, Stephen. Hello, Tom. And I like the way you put your head up, uh, your hand up in acknowledgement. Just in case people are confused as to who the which, which one which, that was. Well, the, 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 the picture's all of you. Scott isn't in, fo in camera yet. <laughs> OK, Have, are you, you are known as that bloke from Brighton, aren't you? I am, absolutely. And, and, and it's lovely to be here, bearing in mind there is no form of direct public transport to get me home after the show. Well done. That's the kind of bravery we like to see from our guests <laughs> here on Headliners. And we also have the comforting calm of Scott Kapoor. You know, you can take a taxi. They're public. Anyone can use them. There's that. To, to Brighton. <laughs> <laughs> A little bit of friction on the panel here. <laughs> A little bit of friction, right? That's the uh, pre-show mildly amusing bants out of the way. Let us turn our attention to the headlines and we start with the Daily Mail, which has unrivaled expert analysis, so it claims, and the headline is now slash taxes even further. Amen. The Telegraph has the biggest fall in living standards on record, and we move straight on to the Times, which has biggest fall in living standards since the 1950s, and also on the side there, extra 6,000 missiles and war funds for Ukraine. On to the Independent, and it has UK faces biggest fall in living standards on record. There's a common theme through today's headlines. We move on to the Mirror, which has Sunak's sickener, thanks for nothing. Nothing to help energy bills, uh, nothing to help as energy bills set to soar by 1,300 quid, nothing to support struggling pensioners, nothing to stop worst fall in living standards since 50s, and nothing much to soften petrol pain. Uh, the mirror um, wearing its colours pretty boldly there. On to the Financial Times, which has Sunak Bank's windfall for pre-election tax cut as cost of living crisis hits home. We move on to The Guardian. Cost of living surges and Sunak squeezes poorest. Um, on to the Daily Express, which has the forgotten millions say, what about us? And there's also a little uh, picture of Prince William and Kate at the top there. William takes firm stance on slavery. Finally. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and we go on to last, but uh, by no means least, the Daily Star, which um, I think whoever writ today, wrote today's headline should possibly be knighted. The Up Yours mini budget inside today, the usual load of utter bull from a rich, insincere, smiling politician with nice teeth. Uh, while we'll all be worse off than the 1950s, but all be beep well thankful. And finally, how cost of living crisis is not the fault of absolutely anybody at all in government. All <laughs> hail the Daily Star. And those are um, tomorrow's headlines. Or if you're watching... And we kick off with Thursday's Guardian. Another year, another budget, another missed opportunity. Lots of noise from the press and the op opposition. Nothing substantial changes. Same old, same old, same old, Stephen. Well, I mean, it's the cost of living crisis that everyone's focusing on, so that's what they've dived in on. I, do you remember in the past when uh, budgets were about kind of how we're going to enable investment in futures and new technologies and all the rest of it? Now it's about trying to push back the tide. And this is what's happened. Uh, there's three main headlines of what Sunak's doing to help. Uh, and as you can see, a lot of newspapers feel it's not much or if anything at all. It's the 5p off the fuel, and that will come in effectively... It's already come in, yeah, as we speak. Yeah, it's already come in already. Six o'clock this evening. Uh, it's the um, raise uh, of the threshold at which you pay national insurance, going up by £3,000 to, I think it's £12,570, uh, £12, and then uh, one pence off in income tax. So that comes in in 2024, and yeah, the national so insurance... It hasn't July. happened yet. Not only will not happen yet, I think it's imminently very close to a general election, so I think it's almost a little bit of a uh, stick with us, guys, and there'll be slightly less tax to pay. Yeah, and also it's worth noting that with the national insurance rises that have been 
you know, projected for a long time mm. that he's stuck with, slashing 1p off the income tax won't make any difference anyway. He may as well have not bother with the national insurance. Yeah, rate. I think what Richie's saying is that, you know, we told you we're going to punch you in the face. Well, we're going to wear slightly softer gloves. I, I think this is effectively what's happening here. The, the, the impact of the tax rises that have been, that he's quite... Sort of, I suppose, quite honestly stated, are required to cover the budget, the money shortfall that came from furlough and everything that needed during coronavirus is going to be made up for by these tax rises. But we appreciate that everything's become a lot more expensive, so these tax rises are going to come in either later or they're not going to be quite as bad as you think, which effectively kicks the can further down the road. It's it's a, it's a bad news budget for everybody, sold as good news because the bad news isn't quite as bad as the bad news we're expecting. I think I understand that. Um, Scott, now, my question to you is, Rishi Sunak was educated at Winchester, yeah. then he did PPE at Oxford, then he joined uh, Goldman Sachs... Oh, no, then he did an MBA at Stanford and then he joined Goldman Sachs. Is Rishi Sunak a lizard? <laughs> um, well, he has enough power to be, because lizards are very powerful, as They you are know. powerful people. So I believe that he... Yes, I, I'm, I think... And he's also tiny. Like a little, li they're tiny lizards. Is it, he's a little baby lizard. If you yeah. Google Rishi Sunak, the yeah. first word that is suggested to you by Google is height. It's so strange. Is it? Is it? Yeah. Sure. I get wife and then wife worth. Oh, OK. All well, right. with me, it's yeah. height. <laughs> <laughs> wife worth is interesting as well. Yeah, yeah. It's as if the budget is one negative after another that just cancels each other out at the end. I mean, in, in a way, I think our lives are going to get more difficult financially. But I was, I was most concerned with the, you know, the gas and electric bills. And he seems to have done nothing about that. We keep being told again and again and again that they're going to quadruple, they're going to be larger than you can afford, and then there's almost nothing in this new budget about it. I just feel this sense of extraordinary disappointment because I remember when he was elected, he gave it the big one about being a low-tax chancellor, mm. simplifying the tax system. Mm. You know, he's got a picture of Nigel Lawson who slashed a tax with every budget. And it's just the same. It, we all predicted it. It was just nothing major was going to happen and there'd just be tiny little fiddles around the edges, and that's exactly what he's done. It's his mini-budget, because he's tiny, right? <laughs> there we go. <laughs> a mini-budget for a mini-man. Now it's the P&O story next, and if you want an example of how brazen this company has <laughs> been, I quite like this. The ship, the pride of Hull, <laughs> is registered in the Bahamas. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, because they're good business people. It's a perfect strategy. Um, P&O, apparently, as far as Boris Johnson is concerned, sacked all their 800 crew uh, with immediate effect illegally. They didn't do it properly, and um, now he wants them to apologize, which they have done. They said, oh, we're sorry, we did that wrong. I mean, you're still fired, but we could have been nicer about it. Because as many people know, they sent out the, uh, the sacking message through a Zoom call, which Steve yeah, I was going to say, it was apparently... A pre technically quite advanced. Yeah, because it was a pre-recorded video over a Zoom call. Now, if anyone's ever here tried to do anything other than show their face on a Zoom call, te technically that's quite tricky to do. So on the, on the downside, 800 people have lost, you know, lifelong careers. But on the plus side, uh, the uh, CEO of P&O has really worked out how to bang out a Zoom I want to call, call him. I want to call him. I can't fix... I can't make my Hugh Philip light bulb work by command. So maybe he'll come by my house and... Help me with that. What do you think? Maybe, maybe. But anyway, uh, these people were apparently treated badly when they were fired. Apparently, there were armed armed guards on the boats and in the offices with handcuffs. Now, uh, you're kidding. The, well, that's what I read the paper. And but he addresses this. The guy who's the head of P E O P and O. He said, contrary to rumors, none of our people wore balaclavas, nor were they directed to use handcuffs nor force. He says that was all a media story that never happened, that the employees that were fired were treated well, even though they were canned by Zoom call. And um, apparently there's, there's compensation packages available, more than 36 million pounds, or that can be identified at a 13 weeks salary in lieu of notice will be paid to the employees. He's saying... Now, the CEO of P&O is a mm. chap called Peter Hebblethwaite. Yeah, he's the one who said and, there were no handcuffs. And, yeah, and when I was... I remember this very clearly. There was a boy, when I was five years old, growing up in Putney, mm. called Peter Hebblethwaite, who lived in the same oh. in the same street, and we used to play together. And I'm wondering if it's the same... Did you, same you play with handcuffs? Did you play with handcuffs? I, I, I think five minutes on Facebook should reveal all yeah. the yeah. other <laughs> thought. I remember um, he sacked me once for uh, doing nothing. But <laughs> I, believe, I believe that the point you made about the pride of Hull being registered in Bahamas is, is, apart from being a very funny fact, yeah. is kind of where this story is coming from. Mm. Because the sacking 
the sackings were illegal under UK employment law, mm. but P&O have kind of <clears throat> sort of coughed their way through explaining the fact that they're not really a British company. Well, that's yeah. how they're doing this. They say they don't have to abide by UK law. Yeah, but... they're owned by a Dubai company, and so it's Dubai employment law. Which, yeah. which I believe involves basically throwing your passport into a fire and saying best of luck. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and keeping like the temperature yeah. posted not under... similar from Qatar yes. employment law. And you have to keep so, the temperature yeah. posted at a certain degree so that people can still work because it goes over. Yeah. Which doesn't happen here. Anyway, so yeah, it's, it's not a great story for the employees, really. But Boris is... He's on it. He's on it, which is good to know. Um, uh, deal with it competently, <laughs> Boris. Right, on to Thursday. Triple Sun. snap by Boris is what I think just happened. Gas leaks, Stephen, in East London, and the same gas that was used by Germans as a weapon in World War I. Well, I mean, with that setup, it sounds horrific, doesn't it? Because realistically, if you hear a story about a, a gas. World War I. World War I, not World War II. Admittedly. But yeah. if you hear a story about a gas event, you know, during these heightened times, potential war with Russia, a terrorist alert. I still doesn't, don't think it's dropped below level four, actually, uh, at the moment as well, and you, you'd be panicking, wouldn't you? But it's the London Aquatic Centre. Uh, delivery of chlorine apparently went wrong, well, clearly went wrong. Uh, nearly 80 people being treated, 29 taken to hospital, just under 50 were treated at the scene with breathing problems. But, yes, a, a genuinely scary chlorine leak within the uh, Aquatic Centre, leading to, um, you know, people uh, choking, not being able to breathe. Over 200 people had to be evacuated in including school children, so I can imagine it was particularly scary. Uh, but, yes, uh, the, they are looking into it to work out what happened. But, yeah, we are, we are talking about a chlorine gas, which was a, a, um, a chemical weapon. The, uh, the um, London Ambulance Service are calling it a, a chemical event. Maybe the, the kids couldn't breathe because they were afraid in the water. That's usually why people can't swim well, because they're not breathing properly. Maybe it was just their stroke. I don't think it was. Really? No. It was the gas leak? I, I swim was. there all the time. It's a great Do pool. You? Yeah, it's lovely there. Oh. Fantastic. I, I can't swim in swimming pools because of the chlorine they put in the water. It makes my skin all itchy. Well, the good news is it didn't end up in the water. It ended up in the air system and never got anywhere near the water. Sadly, unfortunately, to get into the water, you would have had to have actually breathed the air en route to it, so it wouldn't have been good for you. Swings and roundabouts. Right, a story in Thursday's Mail is next. Iceland is having the, the, the shop, not the country, is having its potatoes rejected by food banks, apparently, because people can't afford, afford to boil them. Now, I think they might be sensationalising this story a little bit, Scott. Well, the, the guy who there? runs Iceland, Richard Walker, says that they're trying to hand out root vegetables and potatoes to people at their food banks because they're trying to help out. And they've noticed people won't take them because they can't afford to pay the price to boil them. And he thinks that whatever's happening in um, number 10, what they should be focusing on is the purchaser, is the average person on the street who's trying to buy stuff. Not big companies, not tax breaks for huge investors, but these people who cannot pay their own heating and gas bills. So he thinks that's the problem, actually, that people are either, he says in his statement that they're losing customers because they can't afford to cook the food they sell, but also because people, he says, are dying from starvation in this country and going unnoticed. So his suggestion is that they cut down on, you know, energy costs drastically if possible. And he thinks there's no way people are going to survive if they don't do that, if the government doesn't do that. You look at this in detail, though, you've got to imagine this is more of a problem for Iceland than just about any other grocery manufacturer, because with the exception of a, an ice cream, every single item they sell has to be cooked. And slightly tongue-in-cheek, but... If you require, you require energy costs to cook any frozen food, you require energy costs to keep your frozen food in your freezer. If you think about it, if you go and buy a root vegetable, like a carrot, which you could eat at that point, and you can keep it in ambient temperature, if you go to Iceland, everything you buy has got to be paid for to store it, and everything has got to you buy has got to be paid for to cook or heat it. Companies like Iceland are in trouble due to the massive energy hike, so you can understand why they're making a noise about it. I think this yeah, I, I cannot help thinking that it's, you know, you use this argument, you go, well, food is really cheap, you can just get some boiled vegetables and you can make a, soup, a food and a very uh, wholesome f meal and it costs you a pound. And, you know, it is about the cheapest dish there is, uh, you know, a vegetable stew or a vegetable soup or whatever. I think people just don't want the potatoes. Well, he's claiming that Iceland tends to be in the poorest communities. It is. So he's in touch with what people are going through. And he's saying, because we're there, 
Our customers might are... still be exaggerating, though. Well, I, th I think the key problem here is I don't think Iceland does potatoes. Well, that's the, the that's one thing I'm trying to unravel. But they're also <laughs> do, they're also doing food banks where they're handing out potatoes. See, I think I think his concern is is legitimate though because Iceland sells crisps and sparkling water. But also, I think that you know to cook any food, no matter what you buy, you know some people have to eat cooked food. They have no choice. Big opinions here on GB News from <laughs> Scott Capuro. People have to eat food. Right, we have the Daily Mail at its finest Oops. next. A story that starts off about the Jamaican PM declaring Jamaica is to ditch the monarchy, but quickly changes focus to what Kate was wearing. Mm. Without even looking down at my notes, a £1,945 Alexander McQueen dress. Well, I'm glad in case the stat, you ask. The stat sunk in. But so. that piece of information, I believe, is to draw the reader in. And the key thing that the Daily Mail is getting across, which is a, an important piece of news, is that Jamaica is very firmly behind the idea of moving away from the monarchy and becoming a republic. As much as William and Kate have been uh, welcomed with open arms and are very popular there, um, Britain's, although specifically the crown's link to the slave trade, still uh, sticks in the throat over there, as you might well imagine, and is being used certainly as a relevant point in the open discussion with, this, with the country as to whether they should move away from the monarchy, and is their stated destination to do so, uh, to uh, move on and have true ambitions to become an independent, developed and prosperous country. Controversial opinion. Could the PM just be using that as an argument to try and secure more power for himself, Scott? Maybe. Did you see she was wearing a trouser suit? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> oh, I, I, th I thought I heard dress. I did say dress, actually, but yeah, it, was it was a, a trouser, trouser suit. suit. Well, I do apologise. Which is the important... Uh, yeah, no, I, I, you know what? Actually, as a news uh, broadcaster, I'd like to apologise to all the listeners right now. It was a trouser suit, not a dress, and that level of inaccuracy does not normally happen in GB News. I'm Let's remind people news you're a comedian. Fake news. Don't, news. don't take it too seriously. Do apologise. Yeah. Right, we've reached the end of part one. We're going to take a break now. Um, stay tuned, as they used to say in 1973, <laughs> because in After the Break, Scott Scott is going to tell us about the male contraceptive pill. Oh, yeah. GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories, make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you ask. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. It's basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes, big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hello and welcome back to Headliners. I'm Dominic Frisby and with me looking at tomorrow's papers, we have Brighton's answer to Jamie Oliver, Stephen Grant. Ouch. And we have the man who auditioned for Superman and who is still bitter 
about not getting the part. It's Scott Capuro. And uh, we... Uh, a, a very rough and ready growl, Scott. Now, how dotty can Scotland get? Scott, you, you can have this one because you're named after the place. This is from Thursday's Times. Well, Scotland strangely admitted to a lockdown idea that they never really utilised because it would cause problems, but they talked about a population scheduling that they'd heard about that Panama had used, where men and women can go out on separate days. And women can go to the, do the shopping on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Sundays, and then men can do the other things. And they just found that in Peru it had worked kind of, but it had, as far as Peruvians were concerned, entrenched gender inequality. Peruvians or Panamanians? Peruvians. Oh, okay. it, they, they, they did it in Panama, and it worked all right, but in Peru it didn't. And Peru felt that it extended gender, as I said, inequality. So Scotland thought about that, gave it some time, and then decided to not go for it. So they were successful, though, in Scotland, I think, with their COVID attempt. And I think it was because Nicola at the Times... is still wearing masks in Scotland. I, 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 and there's a reason for that, though. It has nothing to do with the pandemic. <laughs> but um, have you been there? But anyway, yes, I think maybe they are. That's and, a side of, this is a side of Scott Kapoor. We don't normally see on headliners. <laughs> no, so. it's, it's a lovely country. But, um, <laughs> uh, yeah, but it's strange there. I think Nicola was speaking to the public as though they were adults at the time and they appreciated it. She's kind of going back to treating them like children again. But I think the public responded to her help and assistance politically, and they did well by not doing this. They didn't do it. Why, why they admitted to having considered it, I have no idea why it came up now, but it did in the time, so. Yeah, it's a, a binary population measures have always been curious. They always seem to end up in South America and nowhere else, actually. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, there are, I do believe, actually, in bits of Spain, uh, there are rules where only even an odd number of cars can park in the city centre on certain days to reduce traffic. Mm. And they ended up finding that everybody would buy two cars, one with one registration, one with another. So there's always ways around it's not in South America. Mm -hmm. yeah, no, it isn't. I know, but they, <laughs> but they provided the culture to give people the idea to think that that was a good okay. idea. Um, specifically, though, I, I, I believe this... I, I mean, well done for Scotland for not burning this idea, because obviously it was never going to get past the idea stage. And you can see at the beginning of the pandemic, people didn't know what they're dealing with. They were sat around the table and they said, come on, guys, there are no bad ideas. All this proves is there are bad ideas. Well, yeah. like competitive sport, it would have caused problems for trans people too. They would have been, not, not they wouldn't have been accused, but the government... I'm not opening up that can of worms <laughs> now. Right, Thursday's <laughs> Telegraph is next. And iconoclasm, I can't, can't even pronounce it. Iconoclasm uh, is back, Stephen. Uh, oh, crumbs. If you want me to do a definition of iconoclasm, we're going to have an issue with this. Tearing down statues. Well, there you go. Um, <laughs> uh, have you heard of Tobias Rustat? I hadn't until about half an hour ago. But I have, because I did a story on him a couple months ago, and so I'm really glad this happened. OK, well, I mean, Scott will probably be better uh, qualified to give you the background, but uh, Cambridge College has been ordered to keep the statue of uh, Tobias Rustat up uh, after there was a move to try and reduce him, uh, re remove the statue. Uh, and it's because there was links to the slave trade uh, for him. But ones that are not enormously proven, and this is where it becomes a little bit of a grey area. And also, it was a Cambridge University college was told by a court they couldn't do it. And actually, it was an ecclesiastical court. And I frankly miss the days when decisions by the church make it into the mainstream press. <laughs> um, because an ecclesiastical court has said that it would cause considerable harm to the building's historical interest if they took it down. Uh, despite the fact the Archbishop of Canterbury, um, Justin Welby, called it a memorial to slavery that should be taken down. So actually, there was um, discussions within Cambridge University, uh, within the community, and also within the church with opposing factions. Um, but the... the, the the thing on which it hanged was that there wasn't a proven link to show that his money did all come from slavery. Apparently, it was part of his money, uh, and that was not sufficient to remove the statue, which does open up a whole kind of question on how much do you have to have benefited from slavery to be considered a slave? Well, he's more a courtier. A court, courtier? Courtier? Is that how you pronounce courtier, it? Courtier, yeah. Yeah, to, to, to King, Char King Charles II. That's really how he made, lived for a very long time, and he made a lot of money being nice to people diplomatically in the court. That's how he became rich. And then his... I think as soon as you're having this argument, you've lost. But no, his wealth has also provided 800 scholarships to students. Yeah, but it's a bit like the Hitler was kind to dogs argument. Uh, no, I don't think it was, though. I think that it's different from that. <laughs> and but as I soon think... as you descend to this level and you justify what somebody did in his life and you try and find good things and say the good things outweighed the bad things, you've lost the argument. 
is what I'm saying. Okay, I, I, but I, I wasn't saying that. No, but I was adding to what you said. Of course furthering you were. The conversation. But, but I think it's important to not erase history in people's um, role as well. And I think removing the statue would just remove his presence. I think it's important. It, the statue doesn't have to stay where it is. You can put it in a museum or you can put it somewhere else. But I think that his position and his historical reference should be brought up and should be educated. I think architecturally, there was an argument that this statue needed to stay where it was because it would have caused some damage to the building. It would have caused some damage to the building as well. The entire history of humankind, slavery has played of a course role it has. from mm. the construction of the pyramids to whatever. And you so know, the World we Cup stadium take, right we now. Just in, 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 to the World Cup now. Are we yeah. just going to eradicate the high, entire history of humankind? Of if that's if that's your argument, then fine. Either you either eradicate all history or you leave it alone. I have finished my rant. Wow! Geez. Right, uh, Thursday's it, get it, her. It was quite butch, wasn't it, Scott? Uh, Thursday's <laughs> mail again, and Scott, the murder case that never goes away. I'm sweating. Um, uh, yes, there's. Um, it, the murder case, it never goes away. Yes, it, Bloody Sunday in, in, uh, in Londonderry, or, you know, Derry if you're not an idiot. Um, is ex-British paratrooper soldier F could still face prosecution for Bloody Sunday because they reopened this case that the PPS had announced uh, last year was, was discontinuing uh, for lack of evidence. And uh, the, uh, a family of one, of one of the dead protesters, the McKinney family, protested that decision. And now it's gone back to uh, a lady chief justice who said, we thought about what the PPS said, and it seems illogical, so we are reopening the case again. And um, so, yeah, it's, it's difficult, isn't it? Because, you know, they've obviously witnesses have changed, evidence has probably been lost, but these people were, you know, needlessly killed as they were running from soldiers who were firing at them. And these families want justice, and I completely side with them. They should have it, you know. Any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, the the, uh, the one thing that's proven by this entire case, as far as I can tell, is that the actual the actual legal rulings are all um, that there is no there is no there is no previous rulings with which they can use on these. So these are basically setting the parameters for virtually everything, from rules of engagement to when mm. they can bring things back up again. So I mean, I, I kind of agree with Scott in the sense that there is definitely an injustice that needed to be addressed. But the the regrettable thing about it is, is the legal system doesn't seem to be able to cope with it, and this reopening just proves that fact. With that and much more besides, on to Thursday's Independent. It's going to become an issue at the next election, it seems. Keir Starmer states that trans women are women. And Boris Johnson says the facts of biology are overwhelmingly important. Meanwhile, Rome burns. Well, <laughs> I, I, I mean, crumbs. Uh, it's, it's, it, firstly, I think the argument on trans rights is important, but also for those people who vehemently take stands on either side of that spectrum need to understand that the promotion of trans rights makes very little difference to people's lives other than basically giving you a, a, a point on which to make a judgment. The, the statements that Boris Johnson and Keir Starmer have made have quite ironically not been binary. Um, and I think the key point that Keir Starmer... They're trying to make them go binary, aren't they? Well, they, they, they are trying to make them take a, a, a position on this. And the key point that Keir Starmer was making, that trans women are women, was that of law, that they're in the law, that if, if someone uh, has made a transition and if somebody has taken the status of a woman, then they're treated in law as a woman. And certainly, you can tell from a lawyer's background, that's exactly where he's going. Boris Johnson saying that the facts of biology are overwhelming, overwhelmingly important, I think is playing somewhat to his... Uh, I think his voter base, who do feel like that the promotion of trans rights somehow invalidates that of the gender at birth. Um, but I feel this is one of those things when people are slowly learning that the, the trans communities are, are, are very much part of not only our society, but also of our legal system. And I, you know, I, think when, I think it might come up in the next election. I'll be honest with you, I think both sides are going to have bigger fish to fry. Well, I think some, some newscaster is going to try and get them to declare one way or the other and get a big sting so that they can get a few headlines at Possibly. some stage. But I agree there are much bigger arguments at play. What I can't help but, wait, but think, though, that this does... Mm, there's a large argument here. And it's more about 
equal rights in the workplace, especially for women, I really think. That's why this is so often shot down by politicians and embraced by others who are concerned about the way women are treated in the workplace. Equal pay, equal treatment. I think, you know, if trans people come forward and say, we want this to happen in the workplace, and it does, then women can come forward and say, what about this for us? And other communities and groups can too. I, I think I, everyone needs to be equally represented, and that's what terrifies someone like Boris Johnson about this. He doesn't know where to go with this, or, or how to even focus or concentrate on women's rights in the workplace, which has been completely ignored in this government since 2010. The, the, the pursuit of trans rights, by the way, I'd just like to say, is not about progression, or is not about denying biology. They are just correct rights. I think that's the way it works. I think the reason why this has been addressed is because they're still concerned that what polit politicians say will make a lot of difference to people who are transitioning or maybe teenagers or people who are at a stage where they don't know where they are and bullying can make a real difference to someone's life. So their words are very important to those people, but I still don't feel it's a strong political argument. I'm not going there. The <laughs> Times is next and Scott, who betrayed Anne Frank oh, is the dirt. We still don't know, do we? Because uh, someone named Rosemary Sullivan wrote a book um, that came out a few years ago and uh, called, the book was called The Betrayal of Anne Frank, A Cold Case Investigation. Canadian woman who wrote this, it became a bestseller, and she claimed that she'd found the person who turned them in, his name was Arnold Vandenberg, and a comic we know named Vandenberg is gonna have a hard time with this probably. I, we should probably call him and ask him if he knows the guy. And uh, she said that he, she cited him as the person who betrayed the Franks to the Nazis after they'd hidden out for two years. And apparently all that research was garbage, that uh, other research groups have come forward and said that she is wrong. Experts have largely dismissed the book's findings. And um, historians, religious leaders have all come forward and said this is not true. Leave this family alone. He didn't do it. Do you think Addy van der Borg did it? <laughs> so, look, there is a lot of listeners right now busy Googling who you're talking about. <laughs> Stalwart of the comedy circuit. Um, no, I, it's, I think, the, uh, I think that the reality of this is, is that she, it's, uh, it's kind of, it's, it's, a, it's a whodunit that gets further from the facts as every time they dig it mm. up, to be honest with you. Yeah. So uh, it's, it, a, it's a gold mine of a story. It is. Um, right, on to Thursday's Guardian and uh, Afghanistan takes another step backwards, Stephen. It's, it's so frustrating. It was as predicted and it's pretty upsetting. But the, uh, the Taliban, who didn't automatically rule out uh, girls being able to return to secondary education, have done exactly that. It does seem like there is a power struggle going on in Afghanistan within the Taliban, within those who are slightly more urban and are slightly more open-minded. To describe some of the Taliban as being open-minded, I know seems like a, a leap of faith, but there are rural communities, certainly within sort of tribal Pashtun communities, who believe that the girls that shouldn't be having an education, and they are very much second-class citizens. If, if, if second-class sounds like an upgrade, to be honest with you. And as much as they have literally at the 11th hour denied girls the right to secondary school education, such that girls were turning up at school mm. waiting to be let in, and the teachers had to say, I'm sorry, you couldn't do it. And they stood outside the school in tears for the whole of the day. It's a tragic story. It's a denial of, uh, of human rights of women. And, uh, and it's what everyone said was going to happen. And sadly, yeah. it has. Haven't they we, said it's we, temporary? They've said it, it, that it, it, it's just going to last for a while. They'll be able to go to school at some point. Isn't that what they're saying? Well, the, the, the original ban existed as soon as the Taliban took over to say that currently no girls could go to school, but we're looking at it and we'll bring it back in. They said it was going to be OK. And then at the first day of term, they said it wasn't. Right. Nothing and, is as permanent as a temporary government program, Scott. <laughs> One of your great leaders said that once upon a time. <laughs> right, that is it for part two. I'm glad we heard Scott's rant about women in the UK. <laughs> I'm glad we didn't get him on women in Afghanistan. That's it for part two. We're going to take a short break in order that those who fund us have an opportunity to shill their wares. And then it's part three. Don't go anywhere.
GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories, make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you ask. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. It's basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes, big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hello and welcome back to Headliners. It's part three. When the stories get a little bit weird, let's crack on. iNews reports that we could have a contraceptive pill for men within five years. Will you be taking it, Scott? Um, I'm all right for now. Um, not for lack of trying. But I think that uh, if you're trying to avoid having kids, which I think you are, because of financial reasons, if I remember correctly, um, this pill will suppress your sperm count. Which is good to know. Although your age is probably not a problem. Maybe, no. Anyway, so yes, uh, uh, without suppressing male testosterone, which is always the problem. So much that I want to say, <laughs> just letting it all go. Hang on, we let, don't have the time. Let, let the senior speak. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's for sure. That's, that's, uh, but anyway, oftentimes these things that come up with as male contraception don't really work out because they suppress testosterone and that leads to all sorts of other problems like you know, heart disease, all sorts of stuff. But what they say this does is suppresses the sperm count by fo focusing on vitamin A, which plays a very important point in sperm, uh, role in sperm formation. So they, they suppress the vitamin A, sperm formation drops, and no babies. Yay! So that's the new one. Five I years. just can't see blokes taking it. I mean, a, bl a bloke in a relationship might take it, but I can't see... Oh, I think I they just... do. Oftentimes I hear uh, heterosexual males, the ones I'm, I'm willing to talk to, tell me that... Their big worry is, is pregnancy. Uh, that's their I big mean, concerns. Yeah, so. yeah, well, I just, young men won't want to do anything that affects their virility, is what I'm thinking. I think older blokes would probably be fine. Oh, right. Also, I get scared by the figures of 99% accuracy because it means I have to keep track. And once I get to the 100th time, yeah, yeah. that one's going to cause a baby. Yeah, and so I'm yeah. going to have to hold back at that point. I don't think statistics work like that. Do they not? Right. <laughs> <laughs> we start with, uh, we go on to uh, Thursday's mail. And Stephen, IA, IVF children have a better quality of life, at least in Australia. It's a beautiful segue from the previous story, it is, isn't it? Yeah. From those people who don't want children, but they might happen. From those people who do want children, but it doesn't always. But if you have children via IVF, a, uh, a survey in Australia, uh, which has naturally happy people everywhere, apparently, has shown um, by doing a survey, 193 people conceived using assisted reproduction against 86 people who conceived naturally. They traced them through their lives until they were between their early 20s to their mid 30s and found that the children that had, had uh, been, that were the product of IVF had just had better lives. Uh, they were significantly happier with their personal relationships, had better support from friends, better sex lives, better quality of life. And they believe they've tracked it back to the fact that the parents of those children are just more 
grateful. Uh, which does make sense when you think about yeah, it, yeah, when you consider just how many children more. are not really wanted. Mm. Um, but yeah, but for those people who tried that much harder, and then what they, uh, they apparently the, the regular themes were that the parents adopted an authoritative parenting style characterised by having high expectations of children, but still giving a lot of love and warmth. So um, if your parents are particularly kind to you and you feel you've had a great upbringing, just ask them how they were made, because there's an outside chance that somebody chipped. Mm. Well, that was just the question I was going to ask you, Scott. Were you it's an like, IVF well, baby? No, no, I was, I was wanted. But it's kind of like, <laughs> it's kind of like having sex with ugly people. Like, have you ever done that? They're, they're so Never. good. They're, they're well. You know loads of people who've done that, though, don't you? Yeah, I, well, I, I do. Uh, I, I've been there. And, um, <laughs> and they're so grateful because they're, they're just so happy you, you showed up. And they're, they're so good at what they do, they have to be. We move on to Thursday's Guardian, and uh, no more Kit Kats in Russia, mm. Scott, not to mention Shreddies. Well, finally, Nestle has agreed to stop production and sales of non-essential goods in Russia. I'm not sure what that means, though. I mean, it, what, what are they selling that's essential? I'm not, I'm not, I gotta, I gotta Google that, but anyway, uh, Mr. Zelensky. Milk, maybe? Maybe. What, I, I think it, they, is, it is formula milk that can continue. That's to what they're still gonna here. do. Mm -hmm. I think yeah. that, um, uh, Zelensky had asked companies such as Nestle to stop, and they were finally one of the last ones to agree with his request. So, yeah, the war continues in the Ukraine, uh, and their activities in Russia will not happen anymore, except, like you said, for, for uh, baby milk. That's about it. Um, it's, it's bad, though. If, if, you're, if, you're, if you're hungry and you're in battle, what's best? Just a little candy bar. No it snacks. gives you the boost of energy you need. You, yeah, you to were take over a country. singing the praises of a uh, little dose of sugar when you're driving earlier on. So. I was actually because I don't have caffeine. Uh, but put it into one side, it's, it's just really refreshing to stat, sit between two comedians talking about Nestle objectively because obviously, as the <laughs> owner of Perrier Water, there was a good 10 to 15 years when none of us could say anything about them because <laughs> they were the sponsors of the biggest prize in comedy. They, they no but... longer are. And I always knew I was safe to criticise. <laughs> 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 Thursday's Times is next, and it's all kicking off in Sheffield because of a memorial to bare knuckle boxer Big Willie. I'm just going to salute the, promote, uh, the producers right now for finding this story. This is an exceptional story. Strap in, everybody. This is the moment we've been building up to. A memorial in Shire Green Cemetery is thought to include the world's biggest headstone. And the reason being that a, um, a, a guy uh, called Willie Collins, uh, uh, familiarly known as the King of Sheffield, um, his family built a 37-tonne tribute to him, erected there without permission, two full-size statues, and including, get this, a solar-powered jukebox banging out his favourite songs. Um, it's his... He was a, a, a larger-than-life character, both now in death as well as in life, uh, a boxer, uh, died suddenly... Waving tragically. the Ar Irish flag as well, I think. Uh, the Irish flag on there as well, and apparently his, his funeral included over 200 people from the travelling community. And on top of this, uh, his, his coffin was carried in a 22-carat gold casket on a monster truck, which I feel is the funeral we all dream of. Um, Where incredible. Is the casket? That's all I want to know. Well, it's buried there. And, but the key thing here it, is... It's buried there. Well, a 22 carat gold casket. Well, I, I imagine... Well, that's... So he's going to have grave robbers. <laughs> well, I, I, I imagine you'll be a brave person to do so. And the first thing you've got to do is lift a 37-tonne oh. headstone off the plot. Uh, the council are saying they are looking into it. It's obviously going to be a thorny issue, but realistically, you need planning permission for a headstone that is 37 tonnes. Ah, they've got them on a technicality. What, what amazes me about this story is that I think, you know, you go to cemeteries, like photographers like to photograph in cemeteries because they're always so quiet and peaceful. But if we're listening to a, an endless repetition of Big Willie's favourite tunes, you're not going to mm. find that piece there. It's Sheffield, well, by the way. I forgot to mention this is in Sheffield. It's Sheffield, yeah. I mean, it's so cute when you say travel. You said 200 travellers, and I thought, oh, 200 tourists showed up because it's such a big event. But you mean... People that he said it, not me. Yeah, the members from the thing. traveller community, right? We and, don't call and, 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 and unashamedly so as well, because it's incredibly popular amongst that community. You can see how they've rallied around. You can see how it's going to be incredibly emotive if they remove it. So and be, something and bare knuckle that, boxing is still a thing with those guys mm. and others as well. Well, I mean, it's the, the incredibly Facebook popular videos, man exactly. and also a, a very large family uh, for whom he is sorely missed. So let's not forget that. But the Malcolm Hardy of bare knuckle boxing. <laughs> no one knows who that is. 
Oh, all right. Okay. Oh, no. <laughs> right, Thursday's Independent is next, and then a right. dog was abandoned for being gay, and now it's been adopted. We've all been there. Um, yes, this dog named Fezco was caught um, uh, humping another male dog, and the owners were like, that's it, we've had it, you're out. So they gave it to a little, you know, dog place. And a gay couple saw it on the news in, I think it was North Carolina. I think it's where that town is, Charlotte, yeah. And the gay couple saw it on the news and thought, we're going to adopt the baby, the little dog, and make it feel happy in a gay home. So they, and they renamed it. It's no longer called Fezco. It's now called um, Oscar. Dorothy. Yeah, Oscar, based on the, um, you know, as, as, as homage to Oscar Wilde. And uh, who did walk around on all fours quite a lot. So anyway, yes, this dog is now popular and has a happy home full of gay people. I and feel the dog is misunderstood because dogs do what that dog was doing in order yeah, to... They hump all the time. Status, it's not, it's not, even a, thing. not even a sexual act. Is yeah, it? it's, it's a status thing, you know. Like backstage at a comedy show. So it happens a lot. And apparently... What's been going on here for the last half hour? Apparently <laughs> 1,500 species in the animal kingdom have been identified with homosexual members in them. 1,500 species. So homosexuality is everywhere, not just in the dogs. You, you can't stop it. You can't adopt it out. So give up. Maybe if we, if men and women go out at separate times, like in Scotland, that might we help. Can stop it that way. Yeah, well, it might help to, yeah. Well, you know, it, it would make it more. I'm more worried about people who just switched on and just heard 1,500 homosexual members found inside them. <laughs> <laughs> There's lots of homosexuals. But anyway, this dog... That's the reason, doesn't it? There's no reason why the animal kingdom would be excluded. Of course. I did a TV show called uh, The Truth About Gay Animals. It's a very uh, studied and uh, scholastic a documentary about animal behavior in the wild kingdom. And, you know, we're all just wild animals sniffing around one another. It's the scent that draws us to one another, not the appearance, by the way. Ah. By the way, you know, if you put the truth about in the title of anything, you get more hits. Mm. Little, hit, little hint there for you. Nice right, to an know. amazing story next from Thursday's Metro, Stephen. Yeah, incredible. And actually, I would say a feel-good story, especially if you're like me and like the idea of breakthrough and science, but you may have heard of locked-in syndrome. Have you heard of locked-in syndrome? It's, it's genuinely, uh, astonishingly frightening. Uh, this is a situation where people uh, are fully cognizant and understand everything coming towards them, but they can't do it. They've got no motor facilities left. Uh, can't speak, can't move, can't, you know, even, even eye movement is considered to be restricted. And uh, a, a guy in his mid-twenties in Germany is un unidentified who had ALS, uh, uh, amyotrophic um, lateral sclerosis. I was going to try and remember that. Uh, lost control in 2015. He's been monitored ever since and what they've managed to do is plant microchips at the top of his neural cortex so that it can actually monitor uh, cerebral activity when given certain stimuli and as a result of which they've been able to actually communicate by showing them um, uh, letters and colours with which they could actually get a message across and wonderfully uh, what this gentleman has asked for using a, a, a series of yes no responses to colours and letters is he'd like a beer. Mm. Ah. Isn't Fantastic. that lovely? I was going to say a gin and tonic, but there we go, a beer. A feel-good story for someone with no feelings, which is sweet too, right? They can feel, they just can't tell everyone how it feels. All right. You're being very, very edgy. <laughs> the the irony. Right. Um, <laughs> how many friends have you lost since the pandemic? The average, according to Thursday's Metro, is four. Yeah, you know, I lost a couple of friends in, in California because Americans take everything so seriously, but also... Apparently, people don't like joking about pandemics. They don't like a couple of quick wits. So, they, by the way, this is, this is friends who are no longer your friends, not actually losing people as in them dying. Yeah, no, exactly. Right, uh, gotcha. No, yeah, no, no, yeah, exactly. So um, I think a lot of it also was just because, you know, diff different attitudes to masks, different attitudes I, to I think so. London is the defriending capital of the UK, by the way. <laughs> uh, that's because that's London, London is a Londoners. But <laughs> uh, Two-thirds of Londoners also claim to have boosted some relationships as well. So... It, it, there's a silver lining in a way, so you've had more time because you've lost some of your friends, so you're making more new friends who agree with you about the way the pandem pandemic should be dealt with. Masks, no masks, shots, no shots, whatever. So yeah, I think it's, it's separated a lot of people uh, because I think people were, they, if the pandemic had only lasted a short period, three or six months, that might not have happened. But I think because people had time to ruminate, yeah. to simmer about other issues, and they attach the pandemic and your, say your reaction to it to other ways you've behaved. And that's it. The pandemic was just the last straw. We're done. That it was the, it in was your the, pocket and your behavior 
It oh, was, but people went a bit Looney Tunes in the pandemic. They did. Riots, and, but it was the great accelerator, accelerator loads of things that were going to happen. Yeah. Even technological stuff happened quicker than they otherwise Yes, I'd mean, give people 14 hours a day at home instead of working and social media, and unsurprisingly, we are going to lose friends. Well, and then tell them this did you lose any? I did, I think I probably did, but to be honest with you, I'm so wrapped up in myself, I probably wouldn't have noticed. I'm sure if they did exactly the same survey after Brexit, they would have found exactly the same thing. I think they would have seen the fact that people disagreed and then fell out. What I like is on this, Right now, we all know we disagree, and we're all still friends. I remember having a debate with you in 2015, Dom. Do you remember that? There was no. A, no Andy Zaltzman put one on as well. It was a pro and anti Brexit uh, discussion oh, yeah. in the theatre, and you said the Northern Ireland border would be no problem whatsoever. I did not. I've remembered it. I've remembered <laughs> it like as clear as the day for the last seven years. Um, but anyway, nonetheless, well, they made it a problem, not us. <laughs> right. <laughs> <we move> on. <laughs> Machu Picchu has been wrongly named, Stephen. This is from Thursday's Guardian. Undo your Machu, but keep your Picchu. Um, a, a, US, a leading US archaeologist has done some research and has found that the name Machu Picchu is, is incorrect. We should be calling it Hyaino Picchu, and that is an attempt in a, at a, a pronunciation I will not know if I've got right, because I'm not a, an expert on pre-Columbian town names. But realistically, they have found that we've all been over uh, naming it wrongly for all these years. I'm and say Juana. Juana, Juana Pichu. Juana Pichu. Um, Juana. But, but they, realistically, they should be just calling it Pichu. Um, it means name of a peak overlooking the ruins. Uh, and I've done the trek to Machu Picchu. Have you? Goes. Got a sneaky feeling this story's been included so you can bang that anecdote. No, no, no. It, I, I have no anecdote. I just, it was just a glory. It was like three days walk and then we, I remember we slept in tents and then woke up and it was all sort of sunny when we woke up and it was amazing. And then about two hours later, all the train rides of people came in. Mm. It was, it was How's the food? Memory. It's good. South American... Any um, fair? No Nestle snacks? Beans, eggs. That All right. No Kit Kats? But the, um, no but the Kit interesting Kat. thing about this story is, is that the research has gone back far enough to see that we've been renaming, we've been misnaming it for a hundred years. That's true of a lot of places, though, right? It is. I mean, so many cities are misnamed or, or pronounced incorrectly. People call San Francisco Frisco. Makes my skin crawl. Just right. bristle at the thought of it. Aliens, I'm sorry about that. Aliens may already have been uh, using wormholes to travel between galaxies, Scott. And this is from Thursday's Sun, so it might not be true. Oh, you sound flirtatious. The wormholes were created by aliens for quick transportation, apparently. That's the assumption in the Sun, that aliens came in, created wormholes so they could zip through and then close them up behind themselves. They're folding spaces and folding time, so two places can kind of connect together that shouldn't be connecting, so that, you know, aliens can come visit and then go back to where they belong. But You're a apparently, believer. Well, I mean, kind of. I, I am a huge fan of Einstein, and yeah. it, this all relates back to his belief that the universe is saddle-shaped and space-time continuum is is not is not a oh that one not fixed. And that's right. and, and the idea that wormholes could theoretically exist, but there was no idea what they looked like. But this this is an assumption based on an approximation based on a guess. So I think we can pretty safely say. Uh, do not look around your garden for wormholes for visiting aliens. It will be a waste of your time. I do like the idea of them popping in and then leaving. It's cute, right? Like a, like a, like a guest. Mm. People always stay too long, but I'm assuming they'd want to get back. They watched, but they were worried about losing friends, so they left. Right, that's all we have time for, ladies and gents. Thank you to my guests, Stephen Grant and Scott Capuro. Uh, as dependable as ever, it was a pleasure doing our first headliners together, Stephen. Thank you. And uh, thank you to you at home for watching. I'll be back at the same time tomorrow with more headliners, where I'll be joined by Eric McElroy and Nick Dixon. Until tomorrow, it is cheerio. See you soon. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not...